So uh, hello again. Um, my name is Antonio Baines. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Antonio Baines, and no, I'm just playing. Um, you can just read about you can just read about my uh, my bio in the, um, in your um, in your book. So today we're going to talk about pancreatic cancer. I'm going to follow my colleague, Dr. Furon. And so today the focus is going to be on uh, talking about molecular targets in pancreatic cancer. Molecular targets in pancreatic cancer. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Disclosure, uh, I uh, have a research grant from uh, a company, but, you know, that's just to uh, do research, nothing more. So, outline for today, give a little introduction about pancreatic cancer, just to make sure we're on the same page, um, and talk about some possible drug targets that I have focused on um, in the laboratory, and then uh, end up with talking about drug combinations and chemotherapy. So, I love audience participation. I'm a professor. I love audience participation. So, can someone tell me who this is? Aretha Franklin. Aretha Franklin. And her name, and her, her, she's known as the Queen of Soul. Queen of Soul, yes. So, unfortunately, um, we lost her last August. Um, we lost her last August from pancreatic cancer at, at 76. And, uh, unfortunately, we lost many folks. Um, based on what the American Cancer Society says, about 55,000 folks will, surpass, will come down with that disease um, in the United States. And uh, of that, almost 80% uh, of them will unfortunately die from the disease. Um, the five-year survival rate is 9%, uh, nine, nine so about 9% uh, folks are able to live uh, pa uh, past five years. And pancreatic cancer used to be the fourth most common cause of cancer deaths. Um, Unfortunately, most recently it became the third leading cause of cancer deaths in the U.S. and it's believed in 2030. Now, it's 2019 now, which means 2020 is coming. It's believed in 2030 pancreatic cancer will be the second leading cause of cancer deaths, and nobody knows why. Uh, just to make sure we're all good with, you know, with what the pancreas does, the pancreas is an organ in your digestive tract. It has two main functions. Uh, it makes digestive enzymes to help break down foods. Um, as well as uh, it also, so yeah, uh, you know, so basically digestive juices um, get secreted into the pancreatic duct and that gets dumped into the small intestine. So that you know, it makes digestive enzymes and it also makes various hormones such as insulin and glucagon to control blood sugar. So as you can imagine, if the pancreas is compromised in any way, you know, cancer, whatever, pancreatitis, um, uh, that person is definitely going to have some serious health issues. Now, as you can see, the pancreas is made of many different cells, you know, acinar cells, duct cells, and because it's made up of different cells, that lends it to being able to develop different types of cancers. Um, the cancer that I tend to focus on, and, and many other researchers focus on in, in the pancreas, is ductal adenocarcinomas. Um, and the reason why is because uh, basically 90% of all pancreatic cancers are from this, um, um, this origin of adenocarcinomas. And so, again, uh, about 90% of most pancreatic cancers are adenocarcinomas, and unfortunately, most of them are diagnosed at late stage. Uh, so if you know clear late stage, um, where the cancer is already metastasized. So some major consequences about pancreatic cancer, again, just to make sure, you know, again, forgive me if you know this already, but I just want to make sure we're all uh, on the same page. Again, the five-year survival rate is about 9%. Uh, most patients are diagnosed at late stage, you know, so again, there's really no specific symptoms of pancreatic cancer. People could talk about back pain, jaundice, um, but really there's no specific symptoms for pancreatic cancer. It's usually found by accident um, on a CT scan. Um, most pancreatic cancers are resistant, resistant to chemotherapy and radiotherapies, um, and the survival rate hasn't really significantly, as my colleague mentioned, the survival rate really hasn't changed that much um, um, over the past 40 years compared to many of the other cancers. So again, we definitely have a lot more work to be done when it comes to detecting pancreatic cancer early and better treatments. So um, this is a cancer health disparity conference. I don't want to make the assumption everybody knows what cancer health disparities are, so I wanted to at least put it on the slide for you real quick. Um, and, and, and as it relates to uh, cancer health disparity, uh, pancreatic cancer is definitely, definitely falls in that category. Um, and why does it fall in that category? Well, this is one of the biggest reasons. The incidence rate um, is very high. So about 50, 90, 50 to 90% higher um, 
the incidence of pancreatic cancer in African Americans compared to other ethnic groups, as well as um, uh, when it comes to African Americans, they have uh, worse prognosis uh, than any other ethnic group in the U.S. And then also, uh, as it relates to surgeries, usually uh, African Americans don't um, receive the surgeries um, compared to other ethnic groups. Now, surgeries is very limited in pancreatic cancer anyway. Only about 10% of all pancreatic cancer patients uh, are even eligible for the surgery. But, you know, for African Americans, it's even less. And one of my colleagues came out with a paper, just again, just kind of just showing you, again, this health disparity that exists with uh, African Americans um, when it comes to pancreatic cancer. So here was a, a research that was done by colleagues at UNC where basically they uh, basically used virtual microdissection and were able to uh, basically categorize different types of pancreatic cancers um, between basal, um, basal-like, and classical, and it's similar to what's, what's been seen in breast cancer and bladder cancer. So, so classical is usually the tra traditional cancers you see, and then the basal-like is usually much more aggressive. Well, you, here you're looking at a Kaplan-Meier survival curve, and if you notice, for both the um, basal-like and the classical is worse in African Americans compared to Caucasians. So again, just showing you um, that there are differences that are seen uh, when it comes to ethnic groups and pancreatic cancer. And again, we need to do a, we need to do a better job trying to figure this out um, because, you know, hopefully by figuring this out, we'll have, be able to have an impact on the whole um, disease um, population. So I'm a cancer pharmacologist by training, um, and so I'm interested in trying to uh, basically find novel drug targets, uh, signaling, and path signaling pathways that we can go after to potentially um, you know, either cause cancer, either cause cell death or inhibit growth. And so here is just a cartoon showing the pancreas as a time bomb, as a time bomb. Um, and you know, you know, you have pliers trying to you know, figure out what wire should, what, what wire wire should we disconnect to deactivate the bomb, okay? And so that leads me to focusing on now molecular targets, molecular targets in pancreatic cancer. And so as with many other cancers, you know, there's a combination of oncogenes being activated, tumor suppressor genes being deleted, and it's that combination that leads normal cells to become more and more aberrant and eventually cancerous. And, and pancreas is no exception to that rule. Um, here, you know, we're showing different oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, either activation or inactivation, that leads to these normal cells in the pancreas becoming these different precursor lesions, pan in ones, pan in twos, pan in threes, and it's believed that the pan in threes are the ones that would potentially go on to become um, actually pancreatic cancer. And so, oh, let me go back real quick. So, so actually, um, oops, sorry about that. So basically, yeah, and so one, of the so one of the oncogenes I want to show you is KRAS. So KRAS is mutated in almost all pancreatic cancers. You know, we're talking about pancreas and colon. Colon is about, you know, KRAS mutations are found in about 50% of, of colon cancers, but in pancreatic, it's about 90%. So almost all pancreatic cancers have a KRAS mutation. And uh, just, for, just, for, just for a quick review, RAS is a GTPase, and so it can turn on and off. And so in a normal situation, RAS can turn on when it, when it gets activated upstream and can signal down the cell, but then it, you know, eventually that signal stops and it turns off. Whereas in cancer, because of a mutation, RAS stays on con, you know, constit constitutively, and that can lead to aberrant cell growth and many other processes that can lead to cancer. Okay? And so did research, you know, you know, as well as many other researchers, have shown the, 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 the importance of RAS. And so here we took, a we took a pancreatic cancer cell line and used shRNA to uh, basically inhibit that mutation. And you see decreased growth, you know, of, of the cells. And then when you put those cells in mice, you see decreased tumor formation compared to normal cells, you know, showing the importance of RAS even late stage cancer. And RAS can signal down many pathways, as you can see here. As many, you know, there's many different pathways RAS can signal down. Um, uh, here, because of lack of time, I'm just going to focus on one pathway, uh, this RAL GEF pathway. RALs are GTPase proteins just like RAS. And you know, we showed that RAL uh, is activated in uh, a, a variety of pancreatic cancer cells. Okay, We've shown that. And then a colleague of mine was able to show 
that when you inhibit that particular protein, you can definitely get decreased growth. So you have control here. You have the knockdown of route A, which is, represent, which is represented right here. And then you have route B, where there's no effect. Okay? And then when you knock down, when you try to rescue route, a tumor comes back again. So showing that route A is necessary for tumor growth. So again, just showing you know, different molecular targets uh, that potentially one may want to go after for uh, you know, targeting pancreatic cancer. But as you may be aware, RAS, again, you, know, you would think, well, if RAS is mutated in about 90% of all pancreatic cancer, that's a great target to go after. Well, unfortunately, RAS has been studied for over 30-some years, and we have yet to been able to target RAS successfully. You know, there's no anti-RAS drug in the clinic, um, although there's a big push by NCI and others to really go after uh, RAS and try to, make it, try to find ways to target it. We still are not successful yet. Um, and so the idea is, well, if we can't target RAS successfully, maybe we can target um, downstream players of RAS. Uh, you know, who do RAS talk to, potentially, as you saw with the, what I just showed you with the RAL uh, pathway. And so that leads me to a kinase that uh, came up from a, uh, a microarray screening of cells. Um, so there's this kinase called PIM kinases. PIM stands for Proviral Integration Site for the Maloney Marine Leukemia Virus. Okay, as a family of them, okay, um, uh, PIM1, 2, and 3, and they are serine theronine kinases, and they're downstream of the JAK STAT pathway. So, for those of you, who, you know, that know about cytokine signaling, they're downstream of the JAK STAT pathway, and PIM kinases are involved in many processes in the cell. And so, you know, apoptosis, so they can block apoptosis, uh, cell growth. Um, uh, transcription, transformation, drug resistance. And so in my laboratory, we tend to focus a lot on drug resistance as well as apoptosis as well. So again, very important proteins found in all cells, but in cancers, they've been shown to be overexpressed. And they were first found in hematological cancers. They were first found in a lot of leukemias and lymphomas, but uh, over time, they've been found in many solid tumors, including pancreatic cancer. And this is just some of the substrates that RAD, that PIMS can phosphorylate. Again, PIMS are kinase, so they phosphorylate to usually activate proteins, although phosphorylation can also turn things off as well. So these are some of the many substrates that you can find. Um, PIM phosphorylating to have impacts on different processes in the cell. Um, again, as I, as I say, I, focus, I tend to focus a lot on apoptosis, drug resistance, and cell growth. And so, just real quick, just going to show you some data with the PIM kinases. Uh, so we show that these PIMs are expressed in pancreatic cancer. Okay, so this is just showing PIM3 is upregulated in pancreatic cancer, and we also show PIM1 is also upregulated in pancreatic cancer. Uh, studies, uh, we, studies haven't shown PIM2 being involved, but we've done some preliminary studies to show that um, it's probably involved on some level, but usually find PIM2 more in, a, in uh, hematological cancers. You know, as I said, I f we first got into this because uh, a paper came out where they did a microarray and showed that KRAT, that showed that PIM may be, uh, may be downstream or may be uh, influenced by KRAS, and so we want to follow up on that study. And so here we took some cells, uh, took some cells, and uh, HP and E's are normal pancreas cells, and HP and E KRAS 12D cells are cells where are transformed by uh, the KRAS mutation. And we did a Western blot, and we see that PIM1 and PIM2 are increased uh, when you have increased uh, 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 activation of RAS. And then we took pancreatic cancer cells where we basically knocked down um, KRAS, you know, using shRNA, and then looked at the PIM expression. And really, only PIM1 is the only PIM um, family member we saw where there was a decrease in the RAS, I mean, decrease in the PIM expression when you decrease RAS, suggesting that PIM1 may be more influenced by um, KRAS activation in the other PIMS. And we show here that PIMS are involved in, in, in growth, and so this, this is Anchorage-independent growth, which has been re uh, representative of what could happen when you put cells in mice. And so we show here that when you decrease PIMS, that you also get decreased colony formation as well. And then, of course, you know, again, pharmacologist, so you know, I care about drugs, and so, um, you know, I took a PIM inhibitor, took a PIM kinase inhibitor, as, uh, sorry, uh, PIM kinase inhibitor, uh, rah, sorry about that, okay. Uh, PIM kinase inhibitor, SGI 1776, we took that um, drug and we treated cells with it. Um, 
either by themselves or in combination. So we did two cell lines, Panks and Miyapakas. Uh, let's just focus on Miyapakas because of lack of time. And so as you can see that, you know, again, this is control. So again, drug, drug concentrations versus cell viability. So untreated, nothing happens. Gemcitabine, which is one of the main which is one of the main chemotherapeutic drugs used to treat pancreatic cancer. Uh, not much happens, which unfortunately is what happens in patients. It doesn't really work that well. Um, and then with the PIM inhibitor, we, see, we don't really see much that happens, but when we combine it together, we've got this synergistic decrease, okay? Suggesting that, wow, okay, there might be something here. There might be something here, okay? And so that leads me to the last part of my talk, last part of my talk, um, drug combinations and chemotherapy, drug combinations and chemotherapy. So, um, when it comes to treating pancreatic cancer, there's, uh, you know, there's not really much out there that's, that's, that's been shown to be very successful. So again, chemotherapy basically kills cancer cells, either, you know, either by the cells dying or inhibiting growth. And in terms of current drugs that are available, these are, these are, the, these are the main ones. These are the, some of the main ones that are, are, are used to treat pancreatic cancer. But again, um, there's no magic bullets here, and again, Again, the majority of folks that get pancreatic, you know, that get pancreatic cancer, they become resistant to the drugs that they're on. And so the idea is we need to, you know, try to find, you know, other combinations of drugs that hopefully will help um, patients. And so um, are PIM kinases, PIM, PIM kinase inhibitors, you know, is that a possible idea, possible choice? And so various companies have developed PIM kinase inhibitors. Um, again, I just showed you SGI-1776. So this made it to clinical trials, um, but unfortunately got knocked out due to um, um, a potential side effect um, that occurred. Um, and so this was a second generation uh, inhibitor of this, and then this is another uh, PIM kinase inhibitor from another company. So, these were, so this was Supergen that made this one, this was Tolera Pharmaceuticals, and this is uh, Inflection Biosciences. And so you got these different, you know, and there's many more, these are just uh, some of the ones that we use in our laboratory. And so they seem to be very effective as single agents in hematological cancer. So in clinical trials, you'll see them in hematological cancers, and they seem to work great. But unfortunately, with solid tumors, um, they're not as effective. And so in many cases, we're going to have to do combinations, um, combinations to really see something um, as it relates to these cancers. Um, okay? And so the idea is, okay, well, you know, if we combine these PIM inhibitors with chemotherapy, well, well you know, would that, would that uh, make a difference? And so we did some research, you know, did some assays in the laboratory and looked at different pancreatic cancer cell lines and, different, and the different inhibitors I just the different PIM kinase inhibitors I showed you, um, different, you know, I'm looking at the IC50s here, so these are the IC50s, and as you can see, the, the, this one definitely seems to be uh, better in terms of lower, you having lower doses needed to uh, have the IC50. Um, and then these are some curves just showing, again, uh, basically, you know, looking at the IC50 and, and showing who's more potent. And so some of the things we did in the lab, we, you know, we did this drug screening where we took, uh, you know, we took these uh, approved chemotherapeutics from uh, uh, NCI, these FDA-approved chemotherapeutics, and we combined them with uh, different concentrations of the PIM inhibitor. Uh, so, so chemotherapy alone and uh, chemotherapy plus the EC30 of the PIM kinase inhibitor. And, you know, I'm not going to show you a whole bunch. I'm just going to show you one little example. So here we're showing where, so rapamycin is an mTOR inhibitor, okay? And so here, you know, so we've got this, got this curve here. And so the, the blue is the chemotherapeutic, the rapamycin plus the PIM inhibitor, the TP3654. You know, so as you can see, you know, so we've got the red curve being the, chemo, being the chemotherapeutic alone. But with the PIM inhibitor, the curve gets pushed to the left, showing more potency. So again, just showing that potentially combining the two makes the you know, combination. So again, the idea is potentially the PIM kinase inhibitor is making the cells more sensitive to the chemotherapeutic. And this is just kind of like a cartoon kind of showing you know, exactly you know, what we're trying to do. So in this particular case, you know, so we have a PIM inhibitor, and then you, know, you have the rapamycin. You know, that combination potentially works better together than separately um, in terms of causing, hopefully, cell death. And there's another example of a combination that we did. You know, so we did, you know, you know, we did uh, PIM inhibitor and chemotherapy. Here we're doing, uh, chemo, you know, we're doing PIM inhibitor and a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, um, uh, the panatinib. And we see the same thing. We see the same thing. We see basically when you combine, again, so the, the, the dark is panatinib. panatinib 
Um, it's a BCR able tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So by themselves, panatinib alone, nothing really happens. Uh, the PIM inhibitor alone, really nothing happens. When you combine the two, you see definitely a decrease. So conclusions, conclusions. So one, PIM, uh, one levels may be uh, useful as a molecular target marker for you know, determining mu uh, mutated KRAS activity in pancreatic cancer. You know, as I showed you, PIM1 seems to be mainly modulated by activated KRAS. Uh, PIM3 is an important modulator of chemo resistance. So when we inhibit PIM3, we make the cells more sensitive to chemotherapeutics. Um, you know, PIM1 and PIM3 seem to be, you know, although they're very similar in structure, uh, they, have very over they have overlapping um, functions, but they also differ in some ways as well. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. And then PIM inhibitors, you know, decrease the cell viability of pancreatic cancer, you know, um, alone, but seem to even do better when in combination with chemotherapy and other targeted therapies. And then last, I just want to show you, you know, some other stuff we're doing in the lab. So, you know, again, I'm interested in drug resistance. PIM inhibitors are, you know, involved in drug resistance. And so here, a uh, recent paper that came out uh, a few months ago last year, you know, we're using spheroids to uh, basically, you know, to study uh, 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 synergistic effects between different drugs. And so we have here these spheroids that are made of meopacas that are resistant to gemcitabine and then we treat them with different drugs to see um, sensitivity or drug resistance. So that's something else we're doing in the lab. And also we're studying the stroma as well um, in terms of trying to find inhibitors for the stroma that is the, the dense tissue that blocks the pancreas and keeps drugs from going to the pancreas. So in the acknowledgments, uh, again, this is a team effort, team effort from uh, folks uh, at, at my institution, North Carolina Central University, uh, uh, as well as at UNC Chapel Hill, Duke, and other pharmaceutical companies as well. And so thank you for your attention. Um, and we'll have a quick panel for maybe, I guess, five or 10 minutes <laughs> um, to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Reiner Gersner, <clears throat> I'm a surgeon by training. And I distinguish between surgical tumors and non-surgical tumors. Surgical tumors are, for example, colorectal tumors, <clears throat> breast tumors, and five years survival is anywhere between 60 and 80 percent. Non-surgical tumors, uh, I must admit, is pancreatic cancer. You showed it nicely, Dr. Baines, only eight percent or eight, eight patients of 100 at five years are alive. Now, <clears throat> the point that I want to make is the following. <clears throat> the reason why we lose these patients is not because of local, local growth we lose them because of early dissemination and metastases. So when I take a tumor out and the pathologist tells me all the 20 or 30 lymph nodes that come out with the Whipple procedure are negative, but I send them for PCR, 35%, one third of these tumors already have the metastatic spread in them. So I'm told everything looks great, I send it out, and one third is already diseased. If we did what we don't do because the insurance companies won't pay for it, if we did bone marrow biopsies before the patients roll into the operating room, one in six already has metastatic disease in the bone marrow. So it's a tumor that is very, very distinct from other tumors. So my question is, is because I have been following this field for many, many years, <clears throat> and as with so many other tumors, we have focused on the antigens of the tumor cells. Try to attack them, create um, uh, new antibodies, <clears throat> and try to destroy them. But the problem of that tumor cell is not necessarily the antigen that are sitting on the cell. It's the genetic information that makes this tumor metastasize early on. And wouldn't that maybe require, I mean, a different approach than what we are doing with most other tumors? I must say I both enjoyed uh, Professor uh, Fearon's uh, presentation and your presentation a lot, but the question really is, is, should we treat this tumor in a different way? Because not every solid organ tumor is like another solid organ tumor. We already know that the hematological tumors are different than solid organ tumors, but don't we have to distinguish between the ones that have shown great outcome after five years, like colorectal and breast cancer, and the ones that are doing so poorly and that is the pancreas, the esophagus, and the lung. We published a paper this year supporting 
your observations in science, where we found in five of five livers, a uh, collaboration with Christine Yockby, Zu Donahue, Sloan Kettering, in a rapid autopsy program, livers that had no apparent macromet acidic lesions, we found single disseminated cancer cells in five of five livers. I think every patient going to surgery has disseminated cancer cells. I think the immune system is probably keeping those disseminated cancer cells from growing, but I think the actual operation and post-operative period where you have to restrict food intake leads to elevated cortisol levels, and that's immune suppressive, and the dormant metastases can grow out. And in about 10 to 14 days, an immune suppressive microenvironment would be established. And so even though the patient's immunity will be restored when the cortisol levels come back to normal, when patients are being adequately uh, uh, caloric balance, those metastatic lesions are out of control. And that's why the great majority, what, 90% of your patients having an apparent successful pancreatectomy have recurrence within two years, I think. So we're conducting studies now with the pancreatic cancer surgeons at Johns Hopkins to document the elevated cortisol levels, which have actually been shown in Japan postoperatively, and perhaps approach the problem by um, hyperallantation so that the patient doesn't have a normal physiological stimulus or increase their cortisol levels, which you and I would do if we were deprived of food for two days. And that's immune suppressive. So it, I absolutely agree with you. We, we need to deal with this problem. The second order of things that we're trying to do is, I think, I, I just want to know whether or not combination immunotherapy will take care of uh, the growing metastatic lesions as well as the primary. And the data I presented was of metastatic lesions. Blocking CX4 alone increased the immune reaction in liver metastases. But you know, we don't know till we do the phase two trial. Yeah, and, and I would just add uh, to my colleague that um, studies have shown that, that it's believed that for pancreatic cancer, that window of going from um, a normal cell to a metastatic um, cell, that window is very short compared to many other cancers. And so, you know, I would I would say that in addition to in addition to what we're doing, we really need to spend more time trying to focus on cancer prevention. Um, since we're not able to detect the cancer early enough, um, I think a lot of I think more effort needs to be put on that on that topic of trying to find ways to prevent the cancer from even forming. Um, you know, with diet. Um, and, and lifestyles, but, but I, I would say that for some of these cancers, like pancreatic cancer, that, that again, as you said, surgery is, is almost very limited for most pancreatic cancers, and so, and then the treatments that we just talked about, many of them don't work, so I think more efforts need to be put on, be put on cancer prevention as much as possible as well. But that's hard, too, because, again, you know, we still, um, how, do you, how do you prevent something that we still don't even have a way to really detect early on, so still a lot more work that needs to be done. So anybody want to become pancreatic cancer researchers, we need you, we need you. Other questions? I have one, if not. Um, I apologize if I missed this in either of your presentations, but have either of you seen or been able to study if there are differences in the expression either of the PIMS or the CX, uh, CL12 uh, among races, like whether the tumors have any differences in those, and if you've been able to look into that? I haven't, um, although I'm interested in it because, again, there may, there may be some differences. Uh, PIMS are in all cells, but again, in terms of activation and phosphorylation activity, um, I haven't looked at it yet because, again, um, it's hard to, so, so, so people are now, are just now really focusing on gaining um, cells from African-Americans and other populations. Um, 
that's why I'm very happy to be here and very happy to be connected here um, because now those studies can be done where you now have comparison between you know, Caucasian cells as well as African American and Hispanic and other um, ethnic groups. So great question. So hopefully in the future there'll be something that'll be done. I th we've not made a specific attempt to see that, but since uh, I think it's universal among mammalian epithelial cells that are under stress, because we find it in mice and even normal colon epithelial cells in a mouse. Uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Firon's work, right over here. Uh, hi. Um, I was uh, interested in your data showing that uh, pancreatic cancer cells with high microsatellite instability seem to have a little bit more of T-cell in infiltration. Um, so the idea that microsatellite instability leads to genomic instability or is an indicator of genomic instability, making those cancer cells a little bit more immunogenic. Um, would that be a sort of a, a key here that the pancreatic cancer cells are just not as immunogenic and thus for not, thus not triggering T cell killing uh, as avidly as some other cancer that would uh, otherwise be, you know, checked by the T cell surveillance? Uh, so that's a critical issue. So microsatellite instable pancreatic cancer and also colorectal cancer, the 15% of colorectal cancer patients that are MSI high, they do respond to anti-PD-1. So those infiltrating T cells are relevant. Um, I don't, I don't, there are attempts of making cancer cells more immunogenic by um, histone desatellase inhibitors, things that make cells express, transcribe more genes. Uh, those would be germline encoded genes for which we might have partial tolerance though and lower affinity. The microsatellite instability causes mutations that involve frame shift mutations so the whole new peptide is immunogenic, is not a point mutation. So that's the most immunogenic kind of mutation you have and patients that have it can occasionally respond to anti-PD-1. But I don't think making a cancer cell spontaneous, more immunogenic is a, a practical approach. It's actually absolutely surprising that we are not, in, in a, we're not increasing the antigens expressed in these patients already have ongoing immune responses to pancreatic cancer. We just can't appreciate them because the T cells are excluded from the cancer lesions. So I have hoped that if we fully remove all inhibitory pathways, suppressing the intertumor immunity, we will have a significant proportion of patients responding to immunotherapy that have not previously responded. I hope. Now, now I just have one quick question. Do the BRCA, um, do those pancreatic cancers that have BRCA mutations, are they more immunogenic? Uh, it, so it, the BRCA mutations may also cause changes in a cancer cell that might lead to a type 1 interferon response. And type 1 interferon is very pro immune it, it promotes an immune reaction by inducing the chemokines that attract T cells and so forth. So that might be a mechanism by which, by which BRCA mutations increase immunogenicity. We didn't screen for our pancreatic cancer patients for BRCA mutations or the colorectal cancer patients, just MSI. I don't think a careful study has been done of that, of whether there are racial differences or uh, whether there are differences in the immune system that are race-based. Uh, there are obviously mutations that affect the immune system that they will manifest as impaired host defense long before the patient probably gets cancer. But I'm not aware of that. So, but I'm not aware of studies. So it's an open question. I, can
can I say one other thing? Race-based, economic-based access to health care. I was, lived in the UK for 21 years, and we have a national health service. I came back to the United States four years ago. I cannot understand why the United States does not adopt a single-payer system since the cost per capita in countries that have single-payer systems is less and health care is better. What is the success rate so far with uh, genetically modified T cells being reintroduced into the body? Um, what is the success rate with genetically modified T cells being introduced into the body? So I, I think your question is about CAR T cells? Right. So chimeric antigen receptor T cells are T cells that have been engineered in vitro to have a souped up T cell receptor that recognizes membrane proteins on target cells and is effective in B cell lymphomas, I hope myelomas, but has not been effective in solid tumors yet, in part because solid tumors have this capacity to exclude T cells, whether or not <laughs> you, um, they're, whether or not they're endogenous or you administer them by adoptive transfer. <laughs> 